Hey, aloha and welcome to Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. Stan Osterman, coming to you from my back deck on my cabin in Hamakua, Hawaii. Well, actually, I'm still in Kailua, but I wish I was on my back deck of my cabin in Hamakua, Hawaii. But it's a beautiful view and a nice, quiet place. All I can hear is birds and turkeys and cows. And it's kind of nice to get away to that kind of world when our world's going crazy. We'll be talking about that crazy world with our guest today. But before we get into that, next week, Tuesday, um, besides a great Stand the Energy Man show we're going to have, I'm also hosting um, a dialogue or a, a program for Renew Rebuild Hawaii. So if you go to the Renew Rebuild Hawaii website and you want to hear a discussion from some folks that have experience in microgrids, we're talking about how microgrids can help Hawaii get through a disaster like a hurricane. So that's on Renew Rebuild Hawaii. And it's uh, right before my show on ThinkTech. So you could roll right from that one into watching Stan Energy Man right afterwards. But for today, we've got a, a really, I think, a really good topic. Um, it's one we've talked a little bit about in the last couple of shows with Dan going. But we're going to really get into a little bit more of the nuts and bolts. And the last show we did together, we talked about our predictions for the economy and for oil and things like that. and you know, it may have sound kind of like we were looking at a crystal ball, but uh, Dan doesn't use crystal balls. I don't use crystal balls. We just kind of do a lot of homework and figure these things out. So Dan's going to explain in nuts and bolts terms what we're really looking at in uh, the energy world right now. Because a lot of people are still living in the days when OPEC and big countries just kind of manipulated stuff for their own economic, you know, advantage. But the landscape has changed and some of the, you know, trying to twist arms to get people to do stuff doesn't work anymore. So Dan's going to tell us a little bit about what's going on in the real world. So Dan, welcome. Good thanks, to have thanks. you on again. Thanks, Dan, for letting me back on. So for everybody out there listening to uh, this, uh, this newscast that we're that Sandra and I talk about, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit down. I'm going to put lay down some pieces on the table and show you how the puzzle fits together and show you what Stan and I have been looking at. Uh, I've been looking at for probably more than a year. And I know ever since I've been sending out emails to Stan, he's been chewing on the things I've been putting out. And I think Stan's finally realized like a lot of people that received my newsletter that, wait a minute, there's a little bit more math and numbers and substance what, what's going on. So uh, if I can just get him put uh, slide number one up there, and that's just another pitch for the company, Electrum Power and Technology. And we'll quickly go into slide number two. Okay, so that's from uh, World Oil. And that says, falling U.S. crude supply begins to impact global oil prices. So what's going on here? Well, this story starts back in the year 2014. When oil, well, oil had been $100 a barrel average between 20, 2008 and 2014. In the year 2004, the, uh, 2014, the, oil, the world oil markets had crashed. And basically what it was, it was a combination of the shell drillers here in the United States were producing a lot of oil, and they collided with a country called Saudi Arabia, okay? And between Saudi Arabia and those shell drillers, they effectively kept the average price of oil down around $50 a barrel between 2014 and 2020. Now, Part of this that's important has to do with something called the break-even cost of producing oil. For the shale drillers here in the United States, that's roughly about $55 per barrel, right? And if you're keeping oil down at 50 bucks, that means they're either losing $5 per barrel or they're barely make, be able to, to pay their bills. Now, in the case of Saudi Arabia, most of the countries in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia's break even on oil, break even on oil production is actually eighty dollars per barrel, and most of the countries in the Middle East have the same break even. That means they're they're not making any money selling oil at that price. They're they're uh, they're losing money now. So if you say fifty dollars minus eighty, that means that for six years Saudi Arabia was losing thirty dollars in every barrel of oil there that they were uh, selling. Now, there are two players out here that have a really, really low produ break-even production level. One of them happens to be Russia. And Russia's break-even is actually $15 per barrel. You throw in Russian taxes, so it's about $25 per barrel. The other one is actually Iran. 
a RAND's break even is actually $20 per barrel. Yet in Iranian taxes, it's 30 bucks. Now, Iran had been kept from the uh, international market for selling oil, uh, mainly because of the trade sanctions. And the other reason was because they were trapped inside the Persian Gulf. That all changed this year when that oil pipeline was opened up. That opened up near the, uh, the uh, start of the Persian Gulf and ended up around the, uh, the straits there up near the Pakistani border. So that allowed, start allowing the uh, Rainus to sell crude oil on the international market. Yeah. And, Who built uh, that pipeline, by the way, Dan? I'm sorry? Who built that pipeline? Russia. Yeah. That was Russia. Gra Gazprom. Who built that? So last April 20th, the oil markets crashed. And the price of oil went to minus $37 a barrel. The reason why that happened is because when we went into lockdown from COVID, we all were trapped at home, not driving our cars. We weren't consuming oil. And there are a lot of people out there that had contracts for oil or oil that already been on, on uh, big oil tankers and had to get rid of the oil. And since you can't just let an oil tanker sit out in the ocean because the shipping company is going to charge you money for that oil sitting in their tanks. So people actually pay, oil people actually paid other people, please take my oil off my hands. And it was, they were paying you to take their oil for $37 a barrel. Now you weren't buying it, they were actually paying you to take it. And we were running out of storage places to actually store this oil. But that's why the oil markets crash. Now, whenever that crash happened, a lot of the small business people here who had, had been holding on for a good six years, they started going bankrupt. In, in the droves. A lot of small and medium little biz, uh, drillers here in the United States all over the place are going bankrupt. Now, when it comes to Saudi Arabia, sovereign nations can borrow a lot of money, trillions of dollars. So the, the Saudis are deeply in debt today. Now, a lot of their shale drillers here in the United States have gone bankrupt uh, because of that crash that happened last year. Now, uh, let's see here. let us go to uh, page number three. Okay, so what that what that page there is just drill rigs, uh, drill rigs that were drilling for shale. The top line there is the year 2019, um, 2019 or 2020, I can't see it. Anyway, the bottom line is the year 2021. So in 2019, uh, the top, the maximum of production the United States was producing was about 13 million barrels a day. 4 million barrels of that was traditional oil wells. The remaining 8 million barrels was shale oil. And that was with 1,600 dregs drilling oil you know, throughout the year. Now, whenever the crash happened, right now our current drill fleet is roughly about 500 wells that we're, that we're drilling right now. now. Now, on top of that, um, of course, we've changed governments. We went from the Trump administration to the Biden administration. The Biden administration is not as friendly to the oil folks, though it's probably the easiest way to say it. So what they did is they turned around and they scrapped 1,100 drilling rigs. I mean, sent them off to be melted down for scrap steel. So the Biden administration today is wanting these drillers to go and drill more oil to drop the price of oil, but <laughs> we physically don't have the, dr the rigs to actually go out and do the drill. So now, uh, one of the aspects of this, keep in mind that the United States, our country, we have an oil addiction. We burn 20 million barrels of oil a day. And actually, at the latest report I was reading today, uh, it's gone up to 22 million barrels of oil per day. So as far as energy independent, you, know, you do the math, 13 minus 20 million is still 7 million barrels. We're still importing a lot of oil every day. So, so, so let me interrupt too while you change slides. That um, so as we we had the uh, price of oil fairly low, uh, and then we had the bankruptcies and stuff because all of a sudden the demand for oil was low, and we had surplus oil. Now yeah. the demand for oil is ramping up, but we don't have the infrastructure, the resources, to pull back online and just react like that um, to produce oil again in yeah. our country. Yeah, we, we don't, we physically don't have the drill rigs. They just don't, you know, they're not here. And if you ask the, the drillers right now, when do they can ramp up production, they're talking about next year. And you'll say, well, why do I got to wait till next year? 
Well, because it, it maybe we'll build enough rigs between now and then, but it, we're not going to be able to build a thousand rigs. I mean, anybody looking that will say, you know, uh, who know between now and next spring, I don't know how we're, how many we're going to be able to build, and that goes back to uh, with all these different supply shortages. So the other thing is, is when these guys start drilling, you won't see that oil for six months. I mean, it takes six months to bring it online, and if we're not drilling it today, we're definitely not drilling it today. We don't have the rigs. Maybe next year we'll start ramping it up, but as soon as you'll see any relief from the United States, uh, you know, for more oil here in the United States to drop some of these fuel prices is probably 2023. And it's just because we just don't have the drill rigs to do it. And, and roughly how many of, how much percentage of the oil production in the United States is, I don't know if you'd call it small business, but not your big mega um, drillers like Shell or, you know, are they, are there a lot of- 80%. Yeah, 80 percent small and medium businesses. So eighty percent of them are small and medium businesses, and who was hit the hardest by all this jockeying around with COVID and COVID? And yep. No driving, and then all of a sudden yep. we're driving again, and we're flying airplanes again, and and you know they're the ones, the ones that went bankrupt were basically the heart and core of our production capability. What what a lot of the public doesn't realize about large corporations, uh, large corporations are really financing arms. If you're a large integrated oil company like Exxon, you have a lot of subcontractors. You've got drillers, people that provide all different kinds of services. Essentially, Exxon, the top of Exxon is really just a financing arm. And if you go to, for example, a General Motors or a Ford, you'll find out that General Motors and Ford are made up of all these tiny little companies that make all these small little components. And really all Ford and GM do is they just assemble all the small components to build a car. So almost all industry in the United States is built that way. And it has to do with, because that's the most adaptable structure. It just so happens in this case, we've got, like I said, we had that crash in the oil market that pushed a lot of these companies that had been under distress for about six years. And then on top of that, the regime, the government we have in there right now is not friendly to the, the hydrocarbon business. So. If I can go, get you go to slide number four, please. Okay, so that picture right there, it's kind of a busy one, but it's got a couple key things there. Um, so it says Cushing, Oklahoma. So uh, since we're not producing as much of that crude oil, the shell oil, the oil that we produce in the United States is a, a oil that's called sweet. It means it's low in sulfur content. And the main export terminal is a place called Cushing, Oklahoma. They send the oil there, then eventually it goes down to Corpus Christi or down the Gulf to be loaded on super tankers. And that there right shows, well, it says 27 million barrels. Uh, it's actually 25, but the point is the United States, we could burn through Cushing, Oklahoma in a day and a half, but we're not exporting oil right now. We haven't been exporting oil for probably the last three or four months. Uh, the other important column there is something called distillates, okay? Yeah, crude oil, distillates, gasoline, coarse cushion. Now, distillates, what is that? That is diesel and jet fuel. Our economy runs on diesel, okay? So that there is telling me, now the top red line, that's the maximum amount of storage we have. And you know that 125 is telling me 125 million barrels of diesel and or jet fuel. They don't break it out, they just say distillates. So I don't know what, what that is, but... That, that tells me right there that the amount of diesel fuel we have here in the United States is low. Now that's the fuel that that uh, that powers that semi truck that delivers all those goods to uh, Walmart. Uh, that's also the same fuel that powers the uh, front loader that digs up the coal, dump trucks, locomotive trains, etc. Okay, that is the heart of the economy. So, but yeah, we're not we're not exporting enough fuel. If I can get you to go slide number five. And that there just is another confirmation that we're not refining enough crude oil. Propane, uh, when you're at a refinery, they have what's called a fractionary tower. The top of that, it's like a big steel, basically. The top of that big fractionary tower is a big pipe coming on top of it. And what comes out of there is propane and butane. And right now our levels of propane are critically low. So if you live out in the country and you haven't bought propane yet, or if you already bought propane, you know the propane's getting very expensive. It's because our levels of propane are, are at a critically low level. That's being noted there 
by the Department of Energy. They've noticed that that is at a critical level right now, but that's telling me we're not refining enough crude oil to make gasoline and diesel. Now, as to the precise cause of that, I'm not exactly sure, but I'm guessing it has to do with some kind of a policy change that happened in Washington, D.C. Okay, if I can get you- Also, to... you mentioned that um, um, we have uh, port. If we could import more oil, would we be making diesel and, and gasoline and aviation fuel out of oil that's coming out, just oil that's coming out of the Middle, Middle East, or is- we do make we do make uh, we do make fuel out of the oil that comes out of the Middle East. Um, is it the same quality though? That and, and that's what we're going to go into next. We're going to talk about the quality issue. Okay. And 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 this goes back to and under, remember the type of oil that we that we produce here in the United States is low in sulfur content. So that means it's easy to refine into diesel and gasoline and jet fuel and stuff like that. But a lot of the other oil, like we're going to talk about coming out of the Middle East, is what we call high sulfur content oil. It's what we call sour. And you and I are going to have a discussion about what's going on in Saudi Arabia, what's causing it. But, but anyway, the United States, us not producing that light um, crude oil, that really good, it's actually pretty good uh, crude oil, and we're not exporting it right now. And that's having an impact on the world economy, a very negative impact. And it's, uh, it's causing uh, repercussions and things like, uh, for example, natural gas. A lot of the high natural gas prices you see in Europe and Asia is actually caused by this oil thing. And when I put all the pieces together, you're like, boy, this is like the perfect storm. And that's what we're gonna discuss. So if I can get you to go to page number six. Okay, what that says right there is G, uh, China's struck, struck with a diesel shortage. So and, and understand this is this diesel shortage is actually tied to this whole uh, natural gas shortage issue. And Europe is a little more complex as that's that's a he's dealing they're dealing with uh, Vladimir Putin and Russia, but China they're actually struck by a twist and it has to do with shipping. Okay, now where the shipping comes in and it impacts the LNG shipping so forth this diesel shortage inside of China. Um, has to do with, well, first of all, since we're not exporting oil here in the United States, they're having to use a lot more oil out of the Middle East, okay? And a lot more oil out of Saudi Arabia. And that is a type of oil that's heavy in sulfur. And the next page, we're gonna talk about what, what that means. But the big thing that was impacting a lot of this was three years ago, uh, there was something called the IMO 2020, and that is a fuel standard for the large cargo container ships. Now, three years ago, a lot of the big car container ships, the super tankers, they burned what's called bunker. If you want to know what bunker is, and I know Stan knows what bunker is, there's a joke in the business. And what that joke is, you take a 55-gallon barrel, you drape a sheet over it, and you pour crude through it. That's bunker. Pretty close. It's pretty raw stuff. Well, it's literally the, the bottom of the barrel. Literally the bottom of the barrel. So and it's pretty nasty burning stuff. And that they in those car container ships, there's a diesel engine there that is huge. It's five stories tall. It's a, some of the largest engines in the world, right? But they burn this bunker in these big giant ships. Well, anyway, a number of years ago, they started having problems with a lot of the countries, including China, where these countries, you could uh, come up to near the border of, of their shore and they make you shut down the engine. They come up with tugboats and drag you in. They wouldn't let you run that engine all the way up to the port, okay? And it had to do with just the belching pollution coming out of that because they were burning that high sulfur bunker fuel. Basically. They required you to buy their electricity while you're in port because they yeah. don't want you polluting their, their countryside port. with your bunker oil. Yeah, and understand even China was doing it. So what the International Maritime Organization, the IMO, came up with is they came up with a fuel standard. Now they floated it in 2008. It was proved in, into international law in 2016. So notice how I'm saying this, international law. Uh, the Coast Guard, when they see your ship, they have this UV camera and they'll take a picture of your ship and they can tell how much sulfur is coming out of the stack. And if there's too much crap coming out of that thing, they'll do a heave toe, jump on board ship. They might take your captain into custody, but they'll arrest your ship according to international law. Right. 
and, and they'll, they'll, I, I'm not, I've never been a police officer. I know you've done that, done that stuff, Stan, but I'm pretty sure they'll make your day a pretty ugly bad day yeah. for burning that stuff. In. So the IMO came up with this fuel standard. It took effect January 1st of 2020. So the big car container ships, they had three choices. Choice number one, put a scrubber in that ship, which is a $20, $20 million mod per ship. Not only that, but you, then you have this hazmat issue you got to deal with every couple of years because of that scrubber. Option number two, convert over to liquefied natural gas. Okay, another $20 million mod per ship. But now you have to worry about do all the terminals have refueling, liquefied natural gas refueling for your ship? So guess what option they chose, Stan? Option number three. Do nothing. Diesel. <laughs> oh yeah, diesel. They chose to burn diesel. Yeah, that's an easy conversion. Yeah. So that is the same diesel that's in that 18-wheeler class A semi truck, the front loader, the locomotive, the dump truck that everybody else burns. So they increased the demand for diesel by almost double. So they doubled the demand for diesel fuel, but nobody bothered to upgrade the refinery capacity. So coupled on top of this, the United States, our, the amount of oil we're exporting has dropped something like two to three million barrels per day. We're not exporting of that really good, nice, sweet stuff that was easy to refine in the diesel fuel. So, so anyway, uh, what, here's some of the effects that it's had. So one of the things Stan and I were talking about. So four year, three years ago, if you were going to ship a, a, a 40 foot car container from Asia to the United States, okay, it would cost you about four thousand dollars to move that container. Yep. Stan, what's the latest price today? Closer to twenty thousand. Yeah, yeah, it's gone up five times. That's the fuel. Um, that cost is affected a lot of things. Let me give you some examples. If I'm shipping product from, say, China to the United States, more likely that product is going to be valuable product, like flat panel screens, computers, stuff like that. So there might be a couple million dollars worth of hardware in that 40 foot car container. So $20,000, that's a, you know, that makes sense. But here's the question we in the United States, what do we export? What do we export? Yeah, what do we export that's worth twenty thousand dollars for forty foot cargo container? Mm, got me on that one. Yeah, well, so does everybody else because out at the port of Long Beach Center in Los Angeles, that's really what the pile is. There's a pile of empty containers and nobody's exporting anything. And so in Asia, they have a shortage of the containers because none of them are coming back because we just don't have anything that economically makes sense to ship back to Asia $20,000 per container, right? So it's, it's turned in that, so this whole thing is snarled by that whole fuel thing is what I'm getting at here. Okay, so, and that's also complicated the liquefied natural gas situation overseas. Okay, so if I can get you to go to page number seven. Page number seven, this is where everything collides. So that is uh, what's called a block engineering diagram. It's what we engineers use. And the key to that little thing, well, you don't have to know a whole bunch of technical stuff about it. Really, all you need to do is you take that thing, you print it out, you pull out your little yellow highlight, your yellow highlighter, and highlight everything on there that says H2. And you're going to figure out your oil refinery. They use a lot of hydrogen at that oil refinery. And actually, it's blue hydrogen. They make it from natural gas. You say, Dan, what the heck do they use all the hydrogen for in that oil refinery? Removing sulfur from the product. Now, so one of the, you know, so here in the US, we have that low sulfur crude oil. In the Middle East, they get a lot of the high sulfur crude oil, and that's coming out of Saudi Arabia. So a lot of the natural gas right now, um, because they're using that high sulfur rate uh, crude oil out of the Middle East, running it through the refineries in Asia, that's Japan, Korea, China, et cetera, uh, and even including Europe, they're consuming a lot of natural gas just refining that heavy sour crude oil in a diesel, gasoline, and jet fuel. And that's caused a shortage of, of natural gas, liquefied natural gas. 
so the number one consumer of hydrogen in the world happens to be an oil refinery. And that's one of those little details though. Nobody, I mean, everybody talks about most of the hydrogen is blue hydrogen, but they won't tell you what it's used for or who's using. Well, it's an oil refinery. The number two on that list is uh, any place that makes anhydrous ammonia fertilizer. Okay, so that's where the liquefied natural gas, the Middle East, have basically collided with that heavy sour because we're not exporting that light sweet. Now, on top of that, something that came out today, and it's something I've known about for quite a long time, but you don't come out and say this, but today, Saudi Arabia finally admitted that they're not able to produce as much oil as they did in the past. And what I mean by that is at best, Saudi Arabia is probably able to only produce about 8 million barrels of oil a day. The other thing about that crude is it's very high in sulfur. Now, the reason why I can say I suspected it is simply this. When an oil deposit, when you start hitting near the bottom, the stuff in the bottom, well, basically it's asphalt. You know, that's the stuff out in front of your high out the road. The molecules get really long and sticky and it's full of sulfur. So if you've measured any of the crude oil coming out of the Middle East out of Saudi Arabia, over the last probably 15 years, you've noticed the sulfur levels are just steadily going up. And that tells you that, you know, that the time is coming, you know, I, it's probably not gonna happen immediately, but the production there in Saudi Arabia is slowly dropping up. So we're just gonna have, the world is looking into the mouth of just plain less crude oil. Not only that is it less crude oil, but it's less quality crude oil. And that crude oil will consume ever more amounts of natural gas to turn it into uh, fuels. So if you want to know how severe that shortage is becoming, like here in the United States, if you looked at some of the slides from oilprice.com, it'll show uh, natural gas here in the United States is roughly like $5.50 per million BTUs or something like that. Um, I was looking at the contract in Japan, the spot market price in Japan right now. The Russians have opened up the spigot. They're dumping a little bit more gas into uh, the uh, into the Japanese Korean area, right? But even then, yeah, uh, a million BTUs of liquefied natural gas in South Korea and Japan right now is thirty dollars per million BTUs. Wow. Um, England right now, uh, it looks like they haven't released it, but it's still about forty-two dollars per million BTUs in Europe. Okay. And some of that is tied back to uh, the Germans need to get off their tail end and approve Vladimir Putin's Nord Stream 2 pipeline to pump more gas into Europe. And they're pointing a lot of fingers at this guy. But when I look at the capacity, he's got, he's got three running pipelines right now. He's pumping at max capacity. OK, they're saying he's not cranking enough gas. And I, I'm looking at the numbers from the system. He's pumping max right now. So. It's kind of annoying they're pointing fingers and making that the bay of the bad, bad guy when this isn't his doing. It's just, well, I mean, just to be honest, it's just plain poor planning on their part. You know, and it goes back to what Stan and I knew about we need to go to renewables, but you, you've got to have some thought about how you do this. You have to plan this thing. And if you don't plan it out and you're just worried about politics, this is a truck that will run you over and it's merciless. So this is where all those things come together and it's the perfect storm. And not only that, if you notice what I talked about ammonia, ammonia, anhydrous ammonia, uh, China stopped exporting anhydrous uh, ammonia and urea, that's fertilizer. Fertilizer, that affects foods. That means your food prices are going up. Just so you, and this is all tied back to, because you know, we're not drilling enough of that shell oil providing that low sulfur crude, and now it's impacted liquefied natural gas and natural gas. It's even affected natural gas here. Now we got lucky right now here in the United States, believe it or not, Chenier and some of the big LNG exporters, they're not able to export as much gas because of some technology. So if I can get you to go to next page, uh, page number eight, that's steel, it's already impacted steel production, right? There's a crash in the world. So the steel market because of this issue with, uh, with liquefied natural, with natural gas, the energy price is going high. And if I can get you to do page number nine, and this is uh, coal, We're running out of coal here in the United States. And what that has to do with something I already talked with Stan about, and that is if you're burning brown coal in your coal-fired power plant, 
and it's lig lignite is brown coal, so less than 40% carbon content. Remember, that front loader that digs up the coal, it burns diesel. Your dump truck burns diesel. Your locomotive train burns diesel. The diesel price will make brown coal uneconomical, which means you can't burn that stuff in your power plant. You can't do it economically. And what will drive that out of business is simply just the price of diesel. So the bigger story here about this whole story, and the bigger picture here, and it's something we're going to have to address. And it'll take a little time for the powers to be to sort of piece all these pieces together. But really what this means is we need to de diversify out of some critical elements that are using diesel. Now, one of the possibilities out there, I know Kenworth has a hydrogen powered semi truck. Uh, they did a lot of work with, uh, uh, with Toyota on a hydrogen powered Kenworth class eight semi truck, right? And I don't know what anybody's doing on like front loaders and that type of equipment. It's a lot easier to move that equipment on the you know, alternative fuel like hydrogen than going back trying to retrofit all those cargo container ships and, and super tankers, okay? So, but we as a country, I mean, you may not understand what I'm saying. Hopefully people will play this video a couple more times and chew on what I'm telling them. But, but, um, but eventually, eventually that's the path we're probably, uh, more likely, the more likely that's the path we're gonna have to work down. So I, that's about all I've got there, Stan. Well, yeah, and we're running completely. In fact, we're running a little yeah. bit over time, yeah. but um, I, I thought it was important to let you wrap up there and show that coal is impacted steel is impacted, all transportation, getting goods and services to and from ports and places where they're sold is impacted. Fertilizer. For, fertilizer for growing crops is impacted. Equipment for raising crops and dealing with, it's all impacted. So if you think that inflation is temporary here and you think how much energy costs impact inflation, we're in for a long haul here. And that was kind of the main point of this whole show. So Dan, I'd like to thank you for being on and, and taking us through that, that maze. I'm sure a lot of people haven't really thought about all those implications and the price of oil and, and the impacts of trying to, to decarbonize the world in a week. Um, it just can't be done. You've got to really plan it out. You've got to think it out. you got to do it in the right steps to make it work. So thanks for your, uh, your, your detailed explanation today, Dan. And I hope that so, some people will look through this thing a few times, especially policymakers, and begin to understand what they're doing when they, when they come to some of these conclusions. So un, until next week, uh, I'd like to say aloha to Dan, and we'll have him back on for sure, because he and I talk about a lot of stuff together. But until next week, Tuesday, Stan, the Energy Man, signing off. Aloha. Thanks, Stan.